Hello, I am Betsy Sussler, BOMS Editor-in-Chief, and I would like to welcome you to BOMS Oral History Live with Odili Donald Odita and Ogochukwu Smooth C. Nizui. BOMS Oral History Project was launched in 2014 on bombmagazine.org, its home. It's dedicated to collecting, developing, and preserving the life stories of distinguished visual artists of the African diaspora. Our first histories included Edward Clark by Jack Whitten, Adger Cowens by Carrie Mae Weems, and Gerald Jackson, Jackson sorry, by Stanley Whitney. I like to think of our oral histories as novellas, shortish autobiographical novels. O'Dealy and Smooth's entire text-based oral history, our 25th in the series, has just launched online today. This event is in celebration of that exchange. I learned quite a bit while editing their far-ranging history about Nigeria and its artists and about the immigrants' experience in the United States, a story that has sustained and revitalized this country generation after generation. Both Nigeria and the United States are fighting for our democracies right now. So I would like to thank Odili and Smooth for their courage in seeking the truth. And here to introduce Smooth in Bombs is Bombs Oral History Fellow, the brilliant Miss Stephanie E. Goodall. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us for tonight's Oral History Live. Um, I wanted to welcome Ugo Chukwu C. Smooth Nzewi. He is a Nigerian artist, art historian, and curator in the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art. He's also worked as a curator of African art at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College and the Cleveland Museum of Art. He curated the Nigerian, the Nigerian Africa Heritage Biennial three times, the Descartes Biennial, and independent exhibitions at Atlanta's High Museum of Art and New York's Richard Tattinger Gallery. Smooth, it's a pleasure to have you here with us this evening and it's great to have you. If anyone has any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat box below. Thank you so much for, Stephanie, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and hello everyone. Um, welcome to this exciting evening uh, with uh, Adelia Dita, I, I would say that I find generous introductions um, discomforted myself, and I'm still trying to get used to it. Uh, but if there's one artist <laughs> that des deserves an effusive introduction, uh, it is my friend uh, Odili. And so I will indulge him. I, I first met Odili uh, in June 2007 at the Magical Arts OMI uh, residency in upstate New York. Uh, he had been a resident artist in 1988 and has been on, on their board ever since. Uh, but in truth, a mutual friend of ours, the artist uh, Lua Guibe, had introduced us before we met in person. But I remember that first meeting at Art Omai, um, where, where uh, the Art Omai's open weekend with our daily uh, smoking his Cuban cigar. I don't know if he remembers that. <laughs> Uh, making conversation with artists um, and walking the vast open fields of uh, Art Omai. He was a perfect picture of the Debonair cosmopolitan, distant, but at the same time um, engaged, and we've remained friends ever since. So I'm going to share my screen um, as we continue. Um, like myself, uh, Adili was born uh, in Enugu in eastern Nigeria. Uh, his family moved to uh, the United States six months after his birth in 1966 uh, to escape the war theater that Eastern Nigeria had become at that time. He received his BFA with distinction from Ohio State University in 1988 uh, and an MFA from Bennington College, Vermont in 1990. Uh, Odile, who's a professor of painting at the Tyler School of Art at uh, uh, Temple University, is exhibited widely at major venues including the 52nd Venice uh, Biennial uh, in 2007, and Dakar Biennial, the, the preeminent um, art uh, biennial uh, in continental Africa. His work uh, is in prominent collections in the United States and abroad. 
So Odile is known for abstract paintings that consist of uh, vertical, horizontal, and, and zigzag wedges of color that merge, um, collide, or, or halt, halt at, at hard edges. And I have, as I have said uh, elsewhere, uh, his paintings can be unevenly flat uh, when the color planes are, um, are considered independently of each other uh, because they are devoid of graduation and, and tonality. But when these colors are considered together, these bands of colors are, are considered together, they achieve uh, remarkable depths of uh, three-dimensionality uh, on wall surfaces um, and on canvas and as mixed media. Auditor seeks the potential of color to both seduce and dictate spatial experiences. Uh, yet I think storytelling and meaning making um, are at the core of his abstract experiments uh, with color. And as Adelie has stated, and I, I'm quoting him here, color in itself has the possibility of mirroring the complexity of the world as much as it has the potential of being distinct. That's so profound. So I approach either as individual strips or as part of a whole, colors become triggers for varied life experiences that are personal to Adili uh, or that emerge in his consideration of history, uh, the human condition and our lived reality. So Adili also draws attention to how the different spaces that he lays uh, claim to offer parameters of, of sort of gauging his sense of self, the, the notion of being um, a person of, of Africa and of the United States, and, and ultimately a citizen of the world. In early works such as Glory uh, from 1993 and Bad Company uh, from 1995, uh, Odili explores various aspects of the American experience, drawing upon social codes uh, and pop culture and using a variety of materials ranging from movie posters, texts, to images of popular icons, uh, cultural icons such as Muhammad Ali, um, and drawn from sources including advertising, fashion prints, and electronic media. And uh, these are all combined as collages, uh, photo montages, and installations, and address issues of race, gender, and stereotypes uh, in America. So in this uh, conversation, um, Audelie and I will dwell upon some of the many things that have shaped his consciousness as an artist, and which uh, come together in his work. Uh, we will discuss pockets of moment in his incredible journey uh, as an artist and, and exploring how such moments intersect uh, with his personal life, his experiences, philosophy, uh, philosophies and interests. So we will look at, the, at his beginnings in Ohio and training at Bennington College. Uh, we will look at the length of events um, in his life post Bennington College in New York, how he has evolved um, his international career but also the brief moments he pursued curating art writing and art, and art criticism, uh, criticism, and also the circle of associates that he was engaged with in this period. We will also touch upon the eternal question that the poet Count uh, Cullen asked several decades past, what does Africa mean to me? Um, so wherever you are uh, joining us from, you are again welcome to this uh, conversation between two friends. Uh, we will try to make it as delightful and light as possible, uh, as if we're having a drink and eating French fries. <laughs> All right. So welcome, Adeli. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so since this is um, oral history, I want us to begin at the very beginning. Right. In 1966, you were six months old. Your family left Nigeria for the United States uh, at the outbreak of the, uh, the Biafra-Nigeria Civil War. Some, some people would argue that this was the first televised African civil conflict, but still largely unknown to many people in the United States. Um, and so your parents moved to, 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 to the Midwest uh, first, to Iowa, and then to Indiana for graduate school, and subsequently uh, settled in Columbus, uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And you have always referred to this memory of flight and exile when discussing your family, uh, your family's history and how your suburban experience in the American Midwest uh, shaped your artistic consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I think we should, we could start with that. Um, and, and also I would like for you, again, because you've, you've also alluded to, alluded that you grew up with two senses of being. So, so if, we, if you can talk about um, what you mean by these two senses of being, uh, given this background that I've painted, um, of your, your, your family. Well, it's interesting. I mean, 
when you talk about your past and so forth, you, you have certain ideas and certain stories. And then as you talk in different situations, like now and seeing some of these pictures, other things come up. And I remember my father telling me that uh, either, either he went to an oracle and oracle spoke to him. I don't know who approached who first, but the saying was before I was born is this, this child's feet should not touch the ground. Uh-huh. And so, however, one is to understand that it's and it's and as frightening as it can be sometimes when you know the experience of your life after you were born and they meant never touch the ground here as in here in nigeria and um i feel that that was maybe you know some kind of premonition as to what my experience would be six months after you know when i left at six months old six six months after i was born the fact that my feet did literally touch the ground is, is obvious, but it might mean that I was not meant to stay there. Uh-huh. In any case, and that's that. That's all he said, you know, my dad said that. In any case, um, growing up, I grew up in the Midwest. I um, remember life, when I think of life, I really remember it starting in Ohio, just like past, past, past memories in Ohio. And we did go through those different um, states uh, my father going to university of iowa uh and then for to get his graduate degree in printmaking and um then to the indiana uh, university of indiana bloomington working with the first africanist roy sieber and that was interesting it's some of the stories he tells me about that because there's a lot of contestation between the two of them a lot of differences between the two of them and then my mother getting her degree, um, uh, also her, I think her, her PhD in sociology at, at the, at the at University of uh, Indiana in Bloomington as well. I could be mixed up, but they both eventually got PhDs. And then we moved to um, Columbus, Ohio. And then I remember just living that experience, fairly mundane on w- one level, boring on other level, uh, 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 racial um, um, angst on another level and uh, living in a middle class, upper middle class neighborhood and uh, being feeling like the only black soul. It's, you know, my family being the only black soul in the, in the entirety of the neighborhood. And it wasn't literally a case, but I could possibly count in my high school with hundreds of people I can count the people of color on one hand. So it was, uh, it was stark. And this was this, you know, the seventies into the eighties. So it was pretty stark. And I look at back on that experience is just really stark. And my, but my vision and my hope was in other things like things I watched on TV, dreams I've had of being an artist, you know, a photographer, maybe a comic book artist, and then ultimately a visual artist. Um, the fact that looking back that there was a lot of interesting things I saw and experienced through my parents and the heritage we had there. A lot of interesting things I experienced in all the different neighborhoods I ran through, ran through in, um, in Columbus. You know, the kinds of music I was into, hip hop and punk rock in my, you know, teens, going into uh, uh, my college years. And then essentially just living a life as a student at Ohio State University with the really great teachers I had there and the great experiences I had of just being becoming more independent in my own life and in what I wanted to do uh, as a person going forward, being an artist. And then eventually leaving, going to um, Bennington College and then New York afterwards. And so you, you, uh, you count your father, um, um, Emmanuel Kechua Data, as, um, who's also an artist. Yes. Uh, and an art historian um, as a major artistic influence. Um, and he was an influence for me because it was, he stopped being an artist to raise the family. He told me that he felt being a visual artist wouldn't be the way to support a family. So he became an art historian and focused on that. And all my life thinking about that, I was like, I loved art. I, how could I, would I ever do something like that? Make that sacrifice for a family? And the fact that he did and they, he did it together with my mother, that, um, you know, it made me want to work even that much harder when I was in school for that fact. 
And it's both my mother and father who really have influenced my growth as an artist from Ohio onward, because my mother would take me to garage sales and, and things of that nature. And that was where I learned a lot about the texture of things and the history of things, just by looking and looking and looking at cultural ephemera in those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, but, but that, yes, and I, and I, I recall in, 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 in our conversation in the, uh, in the past where you also talk about the, the artistic uh, gene running in the family, even with your, 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 your grandmother. <laughs> yes, and, my, and my grandfather was a photographer. He was a photographer. Yeah. And, um, besides being other things, a postmaster general, they had, he, was a, he, was a, he was a photographer, an avid photographer. And so, the, so when you think about Nigerian um, um, art history, uh, your father actually plays a very central role in Nigerian art history. I mean, he um, was part of the uh, avant-garde cycle called the Zarian Art Society um, in, the, in the late 1950s, uh, that um, in anticipation of the impending uh, political independence, began to think about um, cultural nationalism um, and the way in which uh, it could influence artistic modernism in Nigeria, you know. Um, and, and, and so, of course, this is the portrait of your father, uh, which uh, uh, we'll talk about. Then, um, <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is the circle of um, avant-garde artists, uh, Ucho Keke and others, who, um, who um, in the 1960s, uh, began to think critically about um, how to sort of uh, buck colonial orthodoxy and sort of uh, come up with um, um, a very uh, effective uh, modernist uh, vocabulary that, that will reflect the um, um, the decolonization de logic that was uh, beginning to uh, appear uh, in Nigeria. To what extent uh, did your father discuss um, those uh, high moments, I mean, moments of promise in Nigeria that, um, and, and sort of the, the, the circle of artists that he was involved with, uh, the Ucho Kekes, the Bruce and uh, the Demas Smoke and others who all became very, uh, important pioneer uh, modern, modernist artists, uh, not just in Nigeria, but when you think about uh, African modernism in, in, uh, in the mid-century, these are really, really uh, uh, important light. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I remember it, it, was, it was just normalized, and, and I appreciate that with hindsight, that it was just normalized. Bruce and Apakpaya had come to our house in, in Ohio, visited us, and uh, Twin 7-7, seven, seven, I know I've met him, uh, when I was younger, and it was a kind of a familiar name in the family. All these artists, so important in Nigerian history, were, 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 it was just a normal thing that the names would be mentioned, and maybe their artwork was in the house, and it's, in rare occasions they might have visited my house, or my father would fly out to do things when I was a young boy. He would be flying to conferences and things like that around the world. It was sort of just like the work my dad did. I was more interested in my own survival as most kids are in, in the world, uh, trying to fit in and trying to be part of uh, the social community I had or the tenuous grasp I had on that social community, basically watching TV to catch up on what to talk about at school and you know, reading comic books and, and this sort of thing. So for me, this period, this important period in Nigerian history and, and I would say African history, world history is um, something that was talked about afterwards it was not mentioned in the house because it was about just living everyday life yeah so when i wanted to get back to this uh, portrait of your father because when 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 when, when we think about uh Adeli's work uh we, we think about abstract painting you know and so it's interesting to uh to 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 sort of um see uh, the, 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 that you're quite competent with um, uh, naturalism as well so when was this painting made and what was the context you know, I, I, um, this painting was made, I believe, in 2002 or 2003. And um, uh, his name is Marvin, uh, uh, tr I think it, uh, Trist Tristan, Tristan, I, I don't see, remember the last name, I see it right there. But the thing is that I came back to the house, you know, just to visit my parents and visit the family there. And one day I saw this painting in the house. Well, so it wasn't and, you who did the painting. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, hey, I, didn't, I didn't do this painting, but it was just one day it was just in the house. And my parents are, are collectors to the point of being hoarders. And uh, <laughs> so it was just uh, another thing on, in the house. And I was just, you know, I've always 
you know, since that time, just gotten used to this thing. But it always came to the back of my mind, you know, like, who made this painting? And, you know, okay. what is he sitting on? And, and you know, this space that's right. so interesting. But um, it's, it's um, for me, it's just, a, it's just another emblem of, like, basically the legacy, my legacy right. in history um, as an African in America and, you know, Nigerian. And uh, just a grand portrait, I feel, of, of my father. And I believe, um, you know, it's definitely made in the States. Uh, mostly likely a colleague he met and knew he my father was friendly with so many different people and uh, you know I would always come around to you know if he if he let us seize those parts of his life it would be some interesting person doing something very interesting uh, locally or internationally so just it's just a very nice portrait of him but I, I uh, and so so this is a work of your father. This is his work now. Yes. You know? And this is work from, this is from 1976. And um, in 1976, he was, um, he spent uh, a month and a half in Nigeria. And that was actually your first visit to Nigeria. Yes. Um, uh, after the flight in 1966, so 10 years later. Yeah, you know, um, I remember being a, a studio assistant for him when he was still, you know, doing some paintings in the house. They were very rare paintings he would be making. I wasn't doing this every day, but there'd be times where he, I'd help him, you know, cook the rabbit skin glue and uh, put that onto the canvas, help him stretch the canvas and then get his paints for him ready. Uh, basically, you know, just, I, I didn't really touch the paints too much other than, you know, maybe get the 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 palette or something to mm -hmm. him then he would be painting in the in the basically the the base the living room you know the the rec room basement place and um he i mean with the date here he i i must have been an assistant because i was between eight and ten is when i was doing this stuff with him and it's kind of surprising now to see the dates on these and to remember when i went which was around the summertime right of uh of uh 76 and i remember that distinctly going there. I remember distinctly when he left and how upset I was, you know, I said, don't go, <laughs> crying, don't go. <laughs> and then so happy to see him in Nigeria, just, you know, my sister and I just running to him and, you know, he was there and then we were there and it was mm -hmm. really, I mean, I don't forget it. It's like yesterday, all of us. We were there, my uncles, David and Joseph, these most beautiful men on their motorcycles, taking us all around. And this is 76, everybody's dressing, all the cool people are dressing like James Brown. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> they were bad, you know? And so it was like, it was an amazing experience just, just to be there and to be in a place where I felt, I mean, I can say that it was without stress right. in the way that young black person would have stress in their day-to-day -day life in America. Right. It was really, if, if you might hear somebody say this, but to live that, it's to know that you, not only was I welcome, welcomed as a Nigerian family, members would say, welcome, you know, stay, you know, welcome, you're a Nigerian, right. yes, you're back home. Right, right. It was right. just a sense of feeling, living, and being without stress. And I cannot say that enough, hmm. or more definitively, without, without stress. Yeah. But but sadly, I don't think that's that's the case today in Nigeria. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I mean the yeah. the late seventies, uh, post uh, the civil war, was uh, a very. Um, I mean, there were military coups uh, in the seventies, but uh, relatively speaking, that was the uh, the moment of prosperity in Nigeria. I mean, that was the, the moment of the oil boom, you know, and so, and so um, the currency the, 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 uh, the, the naira was worth more, more than certain, the dollars, uh, more uh, than the pound. Yeah, and even the pound, and and so the structure of the kid that has since set in wasn't was absent uh, at that time, you know, and so, and so I I, I could I could really understand um, that that sense of 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 I'm home that 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 you would have felt when you were in Nigeria, mm -hmm. but then the other thing I wanted to uh, um, mention uh, as we are looking at uh, the work of your dad, um, I, I I think of I mean looking at his work intently, one would think that it's sort of um, it's, it's a, it may have served as some kind of inspiration for your later uh, work, even in your work in general. I mean, when you're looking at the uh, uh, the uh, on close inspection, you're looking at the the surface plane of the work and the geometric uh, collapse traction. Um, they are not exactly the hard edge variety of yours, you know, but one could begin to see uh, the sort of connections uh, to them. The way 
uh, he comp comp compartmentalizes uh, large fields of color, um, just a, a, a slimmer, you know, but because he's a, more closer to the design principle of the, of the Igbo, Igbo Uli. And so to what extent did you guys discuss um, um, Uli, which is, um, which is a, a, a visual tradition practiced by women in traditional Igbo society um, that, that, that was um, part mural, but also body art. Mm -hmm. And so these are some examples um, of that. So this is the Uli, uh, the, 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 the wall drawing, and this is Uli on the body. So to what extent um, did, you, did he actually discuss um, uh, his, um, what I will call his strategic borrowing from uh, what one would call the archive of uh, artistic tradition of, of, of his culture? Mm -hmm. I uh, think, I mean- To what extent do you uh, also draw from that in your work? Right. I mean, the, the, there, there is no real direct connection to Uli for me through my father's work. Um, and it, to be factual with Uli, I actually became more aware of it uh, upon meeting artists like Olu Aguibe and uh, Chika Okeke. But uh, the thing is, um, I know that uh, Uche Okeke was the, seen as the father of this style. And mm -hmm. uh, so a peer, being a peer of my father, he would obviously uh, be aware of this. I think, if anything, I look at the nature of the, the curvature in my father's work mm -hmm and that kind of um, that movement as maybe being related to um, Uli in the sense of all these planes are being def defined uh, mm -hmm. in the space by this, the curve. Uh, right. if, and, but there's something quite distinct in his paintings as well as the sense of the, the they look like solid planes of color, but he's interested in this almost like French uh, breaking, the French style of breaking of the color where the lights, the light right. colors. Okay, mm -hmm. so the paint creates this kind of, this has a surface quality where the light is like shiny, it's shiny in spots. And it's because of how he would change the direction of the brush to ca ca okay. capture that type of uh, um, luminosity, mm -hmm. you know, the where the light becomes a physical experience as it comes back at you and also affects the nature and color of the paint in the, within the space. So he liked to do that. And I would watch him do that and think about it I maybe even asked him about it. There was a little kid of why did he do something like that? But now I know and understand it more historically, the fact that there's, it creates a type of physicality in the color and the light. So it breaks up the sense of flatness there. Um, my thing though, is I realized I learned to draw from these things. Right. I, I learned to, besides looking at Jack Kirby and comic books and learning to draw from this as well in fashion magazines, I learned to draw from this. So for me to see these shapes is to understand how I was seeing forms being built. Also, it relates to this, uh, you know, you know, modernist uh, Picasso-esque kind of cubist sensibility, yes. you know, yeah. uh, anthropomorphic cubism, let's say. But, you know, that comes, that in a way came with the time, you know, that came with the way in which they were educated in Nigeria and how they wanted to, again, take this education and bring it closer to themselves and closer to their own subject matter than to repeat European, recite European uh, dictate. So right. this I see as like, uh, it's an, a, bit, a bit of amalgamation of the West and Africa or, you know, Europe and Africa, but, you know, it's the chicken and the egg when it comes to Cubism in right. Africa anyway. Right. And right. Cubism and, you know, Europe and Africa anyway. So which came first? I'm interested, though, in bringing this dialogue in a way, not in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of an antagonism, but in a certain way, I'm interested in how things can reclaim mm. and re, re, renew right. versus just seen as derivation of some kind of lineage of Western knowledge. But you could you could also say that that was the 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 claim uh, the the modernist of your of of your father's generation also made because it was um it was a question of um it was a question about um, not uh, deriving from tradition but sort of reinventing uh, uh, reinventing from 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 traditions uh, be it their own indigenous traditions but also um, that sense of openness of 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 taking from uh, elsewhere and sort of reformulating that, but that uh, and, and to address that's, um, and, your condition. Yeah, but that's continual. I mean, I think yes. that, that that's like, um, as we can say, 
artists of each generation are always trying to recreate their moment and trying to yes. reinterpret their moment. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of I see this with a lot of young students versus older artists. So a lot of older artists are saying about young students I work with, or just mm -hmm. younger artists in general. They say I've seen that before, and I usually retort back to them. I say, Did you have an iPhone when you when you made your paintings? There's the way that we have technology today and information today. <laughs> Uh, in our world and our experiences changes the way we look at things. So it's just a matter of, of understanding that these claims, I think, make art always and continually uh, make the position of being an artist always at stake. But what makes the artist's work at stake at that given moment is being in their given moment. Yes, yes. And that's what makes art really exciting because um, um, that sense of freshness, uh, even when, when one can trace uh, art historical connections over, over time, uh, that's, that's the, the reality that the work has been made in its moment uh, gives it a certain freshness and, and distinction from what came before, you know. Right. Um, so uh, to move forward, um, I wanted to talk, uh, this is a work from 1997, and um, this is a work, when I see this work, uh, what, what, it, what, uh, what comes to my mind is really um, the way in which um, Africa is so central to the way you think about not just your practice, but your sense of self. You know what I mean? We've talked about this uh, in, in, in different ways. And, and so, authentic Africa, what does Africa mean to you? Tell me about this work, you know, because um, uh, you, there's the first image of you in, uh, in, uh, in Abada, as they would say in Nigeria, or Dashiki in the African-American context. And then there's you as the corporate person, and then there's you as the militant. And then uh, there's the other image. Uh, and then the, then, then, then the, the shirtless the, boy, the poor shell boy. I call him the shell boy. The so, shell boy. Yeah, so tell me about this work, uh, the context of this work. I, I remember um, this work was initially produced for, for, for a journal. Yes, for Inca uh, journal. Inca journal. Yeah, Inca Journal of Contemporary African Art. Okui had commissioned me to do, because we talked about this stuff all the time, working with him and working with the magazine in the early days. We talked about so many things about uh, Kente cloth and African textiles and Africa and, you mm -hmm. know, Africa seen in the West versus Africa seen um, uh, understood within the continent. So, you know, this, it gave me the opportunity to take advantage of an, an American question an Amer and a question that I was given, uh, uh, to, was asked of me all the time when I was very little. When people knew that I was African, they would say, you know, kids would say things to me like, um, you know, did you have to, to get to school, do you have to run past a line and jump over a snake to get to the school door? You know, these kinds of things that I didn't necessarily appreciate at the time. I didn't know how much it affected me, but by this time, you know, when I'm making this work, I could, I drew on, drew on that question. And I turned these stereotypes into, um, uh, let's say coupon-like forms where they had, there was a cutout around the outer edge of the figure with a yes and no uh, mm -hmm. test bubble uh, underneath them. So it was for the viewer to ask this question of authenticity looking at the African type or stereotype. And to me, I just turned flipped this question that was given to me back at the viewer. And it's, in essence, I was thinking of the American viewer having, knowing that this is made in New York, thinking of the American viewer and saying, why don't you take the test and ask yourself which you think the Af authentic African is here. So it's a question about authenticity, uh, Africanness, and um, you know, the public's perception of, uh, of type. Of this type, right? And so, and, and so, this was uh, at the very height of identity politics um, 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 in in the art world I mean, in, in the nineteen nineties when this work was produced. Yeah, it was well received. It was actually well, they, the the new school bought the piece. It was well received, and it was it was just like other examples in my life that where there there are certain discoveries that I've had in my own work where it was I had the idea, and somebody said, "Let's." let me help you or let's do this so you can make your idea into fruition. And that was the situation with Okwe. He said, let's do it. It failed. It didn't ultimately get produced in the Nka, but I was able to further push it further to get to this point where we turned it, I turned it into this test bubble question. Right. All right. 
which and and then the next image is um it's actually uh, I I was looking at this image and I and I and I imagine it's it's um it's the same uh, you would I mean the, the the image of you in in, in dashiki is is this uh, this uh, this dashiki another right? it's another one I think it's another one I have, <laughs> another I have, one. I have a few of these I have a few of these <laughs> okay. I love wearing these things but it's like. It just, you know, for some reason, maybe I don't feel comfortable wearing them in the West. Or my mother always says that she puts her clothes away when she's in America because she doesn't want to wear them on the street and have people get into car accidents, you know. So it's for her, it's, it's about being comfortable. And, you know, I, I wear those, this over there. Yeah. So, but, but this, 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 this image, uh, this picture was taken uh, on continental Africa. This is, this is in, in Senegal. Yes. Right. And, and this is uh, you, your, your dad, and two officials. Um, yes. So this was uh, 1990. Uh, so so 76, you, you were in Nigeria. 1990, you were where in this in Senegal. Mm -hmm. Which of that? Um, what was the context of um, the visit to Senegal? This was the first Dakar, Dakar. This is the first Dakar Biennale, and he, my dad was invited to speak and give a pre present a paper there. And so I went to assist him and also to to be there. And uh, it, was, it was a really great experience as well. I didn't know at the time I was seeing Leonardo Drew and a friend of his and Joe Overstreet. Uh, sure. They brought their show over to this, to this, uh, to this event as well. And um, um, it was my first sighting for later. A few years later, I would work for Joe at, and Corinne Jennings at uh, uh, Kinkelaba. But the whole event itself was just really spectacular for me again. Going to Niger, going to uh, Africa uh, and Senegal, uh, but not necessarily being uh, uh, cognizant of, cognizant of all the intrigue and politic and social dynamic that was going there. Just going as a being, as myself, into this place and seeing artists and art work uh, and in an art space, uh, just seeing it all active and all live. And I didn't know that um, I was seeing a lot of historic uh, situations and being involved with historic things, but it was, I was involved and I was there and I'm really happy about the experience. So yeah, he was uh, presenting his paper and uh, you know, there's a lot of, I remember also there's a faction of people that were, I think they might've been the, like the Pigozzi uh, uh, faction that right. were there. There was, a, there was a lot of different intrigue going on. So I was just, just caught kind of like being quiet in the corner, watching all this, uh, this art world dynamic happen. And it was just, now I know a little bit more about what I was seeing. Right. <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> to think about. Yeah. And so, uh, in 1991, you made another another trip to Nigeria. Yeah. You know, and so um, um, the reason I, I included this image is because I, I wanted to uh, I wanted you to talk about um, what one would call um, well, first a sense of being in the world, but if you are able to reconcile your imagination uh, with stories you may you may have heard about about Nigeria while growing up. So, um, I mean, 76, you were, you were a young, you were 10 year old, and then yes. by uh, 1991, uh, you were a young adult. So, so uh, by then you would have a better sense of, of place. And so um, I, I, I was wondering um, whether your imagination matched up with, with reality and how Nigeria had, had since changed from, from, from 1976 to, 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 to the time you visited again in 1991. Well, it's just to say it was in between from then to my next visit 10 years, essentially 10 years later in, right. in 2001. And because by that time, 2001, and then I went back again in 2002, it was like when I went from 2001 being excited again and then going back again 2002, full year in between my visits, because I was working for my father's workshop teaching drawing, I felt like nothing, I, I felt like one year was equal to one day. Nothing changed from <laughs> 2001 <laughs> to 2002. I was like, this, everything is, and even a little worse, everything is like, nothing is, nothing, there was, I just didn't feel energy. And that was shocking to me at that time. And I guess it's coming to what you understand and what you know about, let's say, the failings of Nigeria on one hand, but on the other hand, you know, I have to say, 
every time I hear something terrible and tragic about Nigeria, the industriousness of the people and the entrepreneurial qualities of the people, like astound, like beyond shock, it astounds me. The invention of people and how the creativity and what they do in the dire circumstance of gover government uh, 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 ineffectuality. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this time, though, we I came and I there and I was again in a way assisting him. He he was he was involved with some workshop stuff, but we also went across uh, the country to go to Onitsha and um, vis I visited my grandmother. And we visited the, the, the compound, the family compound. And, you know, she was, it was as if my father was speaking to um, the soon to be departed because it was, it was, there was something sad about it. Mm -hmm. He, he had took, you know, talked to my mother alone in a room. They were planning things. It's as if he had the premonition she was going to pass away because she was old mm -hmm. and it, it did happen at some point a year or so a few years after that but the the thing is that um during this time with that hair i had then mm -hmm. there was a lot of dilemma because i felt like okay my dad wasn't so happy about that haircut and i was getting st stopped a lot by the highway police because of this hair this hair and uh you know my grandmother we i don't speak Igbo my family for you no know, there's his story behind that as well my you know my brother and sisters we don't speak Igbo but I was sitting there quietly and I was smiling at her she was smiling at me and all I could think of was I hope she's not upset about my hair you know right otherwise it was really another experience in that landscape meeting different people going through different uh, series living going through from one hotel to the next because we were traveling f through different places and having the experience of being on the road in a sense with my father was was really memorable and we stayed at you know like the the great hotel there uh in 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 lagos to these highway hotels that you know Hopefully I'll be lucky to never go back to some of those hotels ever again. But along the way, we, there's a group of people we, my father knew. I don't know these people's names. The, it was a really great stop. Uh, and and um, we shared some really interesting times, which also gave me a sense of, you know, a better sense of what home or what Nigeria, what this place um, could have been if I were to stay there, if I were to have stayed there. But then there's something you said that is quite interesting. That says that that uh, that sense that you are also different, in a way. Yeah, and I and I say this uh, carefully. Uh, I remember um, and remembering a conversation I had with Rashid Johnson, the artist, mm -hmm. where he said he, um, I mean he, I mean Africanness, uh, Africanate, and all of that is something that that um, that he he understood quite closely because the the, the mother uh, is a professor of African history. And the stepfather is Nigerian, you know. But the first time he visited um, Senegal, you know, in Ghana, he realized that he was American, you know. And so your hairstyle uh, sought you out as as sought, sought you out as different, you know. Um, and 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 so it's interesting to to sort of consider that sense of difference and the the piece you made in 1999 called Authentic African, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the sense to which you you are fully um, in your own consideration the African, the authentic African. I mean, you're playing with stereotypes in in in, in the non-African context, and then in Nigeria. I mean, you are, you are you're family, but at the same time, you are you're both foreign and mm -hmm. family at the same time. I mean, there are little things. I mean, you 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 get, people can spot you in a second. Right. You know, you just can be spotted in a second. It could be the could have been that shirt I wore in that picture and how I wore the shirt. Maybe it was my shoes or a belt or, you know, bag, but you can be spotted. And, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, I mean, there was a, there's a very nice compound that was here. They had a nice car and so forth. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, some people have and some people don't. There's, there's a lot of ways in which you can, you can find difference or see difference and be spotted for your difference. And so that hairstyle is what I love. That's how I wore my hair in the States. 
over there it was seen as dada you know like very like rebel very like counterculture uh sign sign of someone who's antagonistic to uh, right, right. uh society you know yeah, yeah so it put me actually in danger to be honest to have this hair and i didn't realize it until until uh, I experienced had these experiences where maybe I would have been shaken down if it wasn't for my dad and some and the driver and some other people who knew what was going on, right? But outside of that, yeah, it's like I've always lived this place, this situation where I don't feel fully American in a, embedded in American culture, in American society, and it was the same for uh, myself here in in this picture in Nigeria. I didn't feel necessarily like fully embedded but at the same time i knew that this is my this is my history yeah it's that is that what you call the two senses of being um you yeah what you you would refer to as uh, two senses of being but I, I want us to speed up a little bit um and so in 1997 uh you were um you featured in the Johannesburg uh, biennial and this was um 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 the first major project okay uh uh uh, uh, curated. Um, yes. And this was when um, South Africa also held a sort of promises um, a lot of African countries held in the 1960s with uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the first democratic election the, the, in 1994 and Nelson Mandela becoming uh, the president of South Africa. It was a brilliant time. I mean, they were having the reconciliation, reconciliation trials during the time that we were in, the, in, in, in uh, uh, Johannesburg and then in Cape Town. Um, the entire art world descended to Johannesburg and Cape Town during this time. I mean, literally the entire art world. It's as if you can say that a, some kind of meteor from the heavens landed and everybody had to see it. This is what this exhibition was like. And uh, a lot of great stories out, out of it, um, but it propelled Okwi to really to the, to the world stage after this show. And there were a lot of complications. Nothing happened in the way, in a timely manner. My work got put up two weeks after the uh, opening closed down. So these pictures came after everybody left. Um, but the pieces were still well received and the ex in exhibition with all its stress and financial stress was really a groundbreaking um, project. So this is this was a work, uh, the moment you were still working um, with uh, photo-based um, in the photo-based mode. But one would also say, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this, this was the first, uh, this was your real first work in a, in a public, public space. You know, yes. Because it's a billboard. Yeah. yeah. yeah and absolutely. then the second work is also uh, the bus shelter. The, right. Uh, bus, uh, as, this, uh, as South Africans would call it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, we selected this work, uh, the image of Bill T. Jones with a target in the center of it. He mm -hmm. Said that this perfectly for him reflected the life of a black male in, in South Africa, that of that of a living target, and this is why he selected this for the bus shelters. And and importantly enough, they had to keep replacing this work because people would steal them. And I think people were either stealing them to to keep them, or maybe somebody was just uh, vandalizing and wanted them wanted not to see this image. But I think that uh, you know, however. It was it was well received to that to that effect to that end. So 2004, uh, you formally uh, exhibited at the Dakar Biennale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and um, and then in 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 2006, um, you were part of an exhibition uh, called Distant uh, Relative Relative Distance, which I actually saw in Cape Town, because I was living in Cape Town in 2006 when this exhibition opened, and I remember this exhibition vividly. Actually, this was the exhibition uh, where I first saw your work in person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I yeah. think one of the things that is so interesting about this exhibition is the sort of um, uh, uh, artist, uh, uh, diasporic um, African artist whose career on the uh, ascent, uh, the Julie Maritus of the world, the Sana Mokudezo, um, uh, one get you moved to, they were all part of this uh, this exhibition. Yes. And I also think the other thing that is interesting about this exhibition was uh, the first time the term Afropolitanism uh, became part of the uh, the public lexicon. Yes, and this was the first time that I felt challenged as a, as an African, uh, uh, but not by Americans as it was always commonplace to feel. But it was really by other Africans in South Africa. Here I was 
speaking about my work and my presence. And then somebody in the, uh, it was part of a press tour, an interview, questioned my Africanness because I was not uh, 100% living on that uh, and stepping on African soil. So for me, I was just like put, it was so offensive and I was put, put uh, I was extremely put off. But it made me, be, made me become aware of how deeply, how deep I feel about a certain heritage I grew up in, in my household in the United States, in Columbus, Ohio, eating Nigerian food consistently and having this reality uh, that I lived in, in an osmosis. And then for myself, I really understood that Africans don't need to necessarily live on the soil and have it always under their feet. But the fact is that the sentiment and the idea of Africa lives in the heart and mind of those that have to sometimes leave it for exile, reasons of exile or for better fortunes and or other reasons of this sort. So, you know, it's not about authenticity is, is many things. And I necessarily don't believe in authenticity whatsoever. In fact, I appreciate and appropriate, like the term fiction of authenticity. And that was an exhibition I was in curated by uh, 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 Tumela Masaka and uh, uh, Steph uh, I'm going to butcher her first name, Stephanie Fitzgerald. Uh, but the yeah. thing is that this was uh, a moment that made me understand the context, the contest with Africans in Africa and Africans who can experience um, their 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 practice in the West, and that there's a difference, right. there's a challenge and a difference between the two. I think this is re uh, reflected in the title of the show, uh, "Distant Relative Relative Distance." Mm -hmm. I think that the title of that show really captures, uh, summarizes this uh, this uh, conundrum that you are describing. Yes, it's, it, it's, it exists today still, although I think it's better for uh, economically and for the experience of having, you know, discourse, information, trade, uh, economic uh, advantages. I think it's much better for artists on the continent. It needs to still get better, but it's much better than it was even at that time. All right, and so this is uh, the uh, the second installment of the show uh, in Johannesburg at the Standard Bank. Um, and then uh, these were some of the artists in the show, but let me to go the Cameroonian French artist and send them a kut uh, kutzato, mm -hmm. um, and with you and your beautiful smile. <laughs> <laughs> right, we were having a good time. Yeah. So let's talk um, Bennington. Uh, so this is uh, an, uh, an image of you uh, seated in Bennington. And what I wanted us to do here is to uh, sort of talk about uh, your Bennington's experience and how it, uh, how it was different from, from that of Ohio State um, um, and what both institutions offered you as an artist. Well, there's a certain kind of discipline and sense of order and organization I got from being a student at Ohio State, uh, the functionality of, of the, the four-year degree program and learning all these different things. I also feel I was supported by a lot of visiting artists that they had, they had a great visiting artist program and a lot of them were coming from New York City. Uh, so I was working with the, basically I look back, there's a lot of conceptual artists, not so much painters, but conceptual artists and they helped in a way, way I feel they helped me to expand the way I look. I would look at things. And I, maybe it's typical. I started out as a sculpture student. In fact, my first year, I thought I was gonna go into sculpture, but my dad was like telling me in a certain way, which I think in the end was right. He would say, don't let, don't let yourself escape this reality by doing anything you want in the world with this form. Right. Try to see how you can speak about these things in this space the space being painting. And it was frustrating at first to, to feel that challenge, like, oh, but I can talk about this with this material, I can use this, I can do that. But mm -hmm. the idea of thinking about saying those same things in painting and not actually using the imagery of those things to say those same things in painting, possibly help, and, and working with the conceptual artists helped me to maybe push the way in which I can expand painting. Uh, in any case, uh, it was great for that study, that foundation and grounding. And then when I went to Bennington, I actually started to expand and play more with materials and the potential of speaking through painting in various more open-ended ways uh, and still working within the challenges of, 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 of the extremes of Western modernism because my faculty there, uh, Pat Adams, uh, Philip Walford, 
um, you know, um, Rochelle Feinstein, uh, Sidney Tillam, um, and, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, Richard Kalina, they were all really uh, profound people for me there. And it was the stress of having to deal with high modernism and its limits when I wanted to think of the postmodern artists of the time that I was really excited by. But I think it helped me, all of this helped me to build my own foundation in a way that I can think around things versus have to live within things and things being ideas. Right. Yeah. And so post Bennington, you moved to New York. Uh, um, and the, the early 1990s was, uh, one would imagine was um, exciting times. Um, and one of the things um, as an emerging artist at, uh, at that time uh, from our previous conversation, I. Uh, you, you were moving between two worlds. There was the, the white art scene and then the black art scene in New York. So how were you able to negotiate the two pools? You know, it was really actually difficult because leaving Bennington and then going straight to Williamsburg, I, I didn't see a black art scene, to be honest. I really didn't see one. It was just, you know, you see uh, black people at openings and here or there, but it was very rare to even in, even then to have that kind of a crowd. It didn't really happen for me until I, uh, see, I was working at um, the new museum. I had this job, uh, was fired, um, used un unemployment, helped me in a way to survive so then I could be an intern. And I was interning at um, the, the new museum. And right. right before that, in fact, when I got to New York, I want to mention this, Dan Cameron, who also went to Bennington, uh, I just communicated in, communicated with him right at my senior year as I was senior year my second year as I was ready to leave and uh, he, I got a job so in a sense he was Dan Cameron the art uh, curator and right. uh, art critic was my first boss in New York City and it was amazing I loved working for him and meeting all these different people it was great but the pay wasn't what I needed I didn't have say trust fund to just like do what I wanted I had to have a job so it wasn't enough and I eventually had to get this nine to five job, which was a job that I learned how to use computers and so forth. But then I was fired from it and then hence I got to the new museum. When I was at the new museum, it was fabulous because I wanted to work in the curatorial department. I didn't get that job. I got the development department, which was better, right? right. It was better because the fact of the matter is I was able to hear the discussions about um, organizing shows. I was in all those meetings where they were talking about the shows, what they're gonna do, how, how they're gonna bring them together, the business side of it, the curatorial side of it, all of that came at once in those meetings. And so I was working primarily in the benefit auction and I met a lot of these artists as we were establishing it. And Andrea Zentel, which, why this image is here, I remember mm -hmm. talking to her about this classic piece, right. asking her what the hell are chickens here for, not knowing what she was doing at all. <laughs> she was so generous and we were just talking about the work and she was talking real life stuff about the gallery and maybe the lack of support she was getting for certain things from the gallery. But, right. you know, she's there making that piece. And then Kim, Byron Kim's piece, I remember seeing that there as well mm. when I was at the New Museum. So many different artists working with Damien. I worked with Damien Hurst on a piece for his, uh, um, for the auction, A Cow's Head and a Pool of Blood, which was just right. honey. And we were just, him and I in the basement for like three or four hours, just talking about stuff, about art, while I helped him put the thing together. Julia Cher went to her house and she was amazing with me, very generous and nice. I mean, so this was a great time to meet so many of these young artists, Neri Ward, uh, again, hearing about Leonardo Drew and, mm -hmm. and his fame in stature growing in New York City. And then the synecdoche work, uh, Byron Kim's work, which was highly influential to me. Uh, as a yeah. young artist in New York. Yeah. And so you were also involved with Ken Caliber at that time. And then they... when my term ended for the job, with my job, when it ended at the mm -hmm. New Museum, I went to Ken Caliber right after. Yeah. And you were, in, you were uh, involved with the Haudina show. Yes. Show. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, um, I, in fact, after the show, I became an assistant of hers for uh, a little bit of time. I worked in her studio and helped her as a studio assistant. But uh, 
I hung the show with Sir Rodney Sir at the big part of Kinkella, Kinkella the space. And then I, at the smaller space, I, I helped to assist Peter Bradley in, right. in, his, in his show. And I cannot forget the day if my, you know, I will never forget the day. Uh, it was the death of Sun Ra. So it was Sun Ra all day long on the jazz station, right. quoting him, him speaking about his work, saying stuff that I will never forget. So important, the idea of just being able to take the chance to make something because you go you do it one way or you do it the other way, you're gonna lose. So just do something. This is one of the things Sun Ra said. And it was an important day of work. I got to speak with Peter Bradley and he told me a lot of stories about the art world, which still stick in my mind today. So, so also at that time, I mean, uh, you were also doing studio visits. I mean, you, 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 you are sort of developing your, your skill set as, um, as a writer, because you would, you, you spend time with, with, um, with Howard Dina in a studio, but also uh, Stanley Whitney and all this. You, that was when you, you began to cultivate them. Yes, yeah, so, this, so this is when I started to recognize that there was a black art world. I was like struck. I was like, why didn't I learn this in any of my school uh, mm. studies in university? These artists I'd never heard of, you know? And one of the important artists from Ohio State was an African-American, Fioris West. He helped me to understand color, not in a formal class, but in an appreciation of it through being African, being African-American. He helped me to understand this in a special way. And so I'm coming to this experience here in 93 and thinking, oh my God, you know, to this day, Kekelaba is a resource that should be enshrined, mm. just entirely enshrined. This, what they've saved at that place and the shows that they've done at that place, mm. it's priceless. And so I was there and they said, Karin's was like, why don't you take these slides and just, you know, you, you'll, you'll make copies of them, make sure you give them back and you're gonna pay for your copies. And uh, I had a whole bunch of slides and I started to just go around and speak at different universities, institutions, including Tyler School of Art. I was hired by Denise Tomasis to speak to her class. I was hired by, um, uh, later on by Jude Talashe, but that was then about my own work. But I would go to different universities and places and speak about these artists that were in the catalogs and. Uh, and then the files of the, the Kinkelaba to people who were like, how come we don't know this? And that's where I got a chance to visit people like Ed Clark. I went to his studio at that time. I went to William T. Williams. I met Al Loving. I met Gregory Coates. I met Nanette Carter. Um, I met Stanley Whitney and on and on. I was just meeting people because I loved art and I wanted to know more. It was also at that time that you met uh, Okui, uh, it was in 1994. Exactly. Um, but also the circle of friends, uh, like Olua Guibe, Aikude, um, artists who uh, were gathered around uh, what I call the Inca circle, as well as Salah Hassan, the, the artist story. Uh, and so, yeah. And, and so one of the things to, yeah. It expanded. I mean, there was Coco Fusco mm -hmm. was there, Fernando Alvin, Candice Bright. Yes. It was really just growing thing. And then people started joining in. B uh, Benjamin Buclo wanted, wanted to hang out with us. Uh, Dan mm -hmm. Cannon was there at a certain point. It was just like, it just became this big growing circle. Right, right. But then there was the other thing you, we've talked about where you said that uh, meeting this, um, being part of this circle gave you an incredible confidence in your, in your identity as an African. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, again, there is a sense of not being able to ask these questions while I was in college. And that mm -hmm. and I reflect back to my father being in his group, realizing the importance, but also the, the boldness of addressing mm -hmm. these questions to your university administrators saying you want to do, you want to have things change. I, I wasn't able to at the time maybe understand that voice that the history of that voice I had in myself mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, I didn't necessarily speak out about what I wanted to do or how I wanted to say things, but I always, also, we always knew that there was a misunderstanding somewhere in, in this uh, uh, training that I had as a student, even at Bennington. And I was pushing more at Bennington of, with this idea of who I am and my mm -hmm. history and background, but it wasn't until really meeting these guys and understanding in my luck that they're all Nigerians. And so they all had an under, understanding of the Biafran war they all had an understanding of what it means to feel like an outsider in New York and to have your vision muted because it doesn't have enough 
uh, respect in the community, we changed that in a way in which we entered rooms. And it was really Okui and Olu in as much as Chike was in London, I believe, um, maybe at the same well, Chike, Chike was, was, I mean, he was, uh, he was in London with uh, Seven Stories and then uh, subsequently moved to yeah. the States. At yeah. Kagulu, yeah. Yeah. And Salah Hassan. You know. Right. But it was really important that for me personally to have this connection with these, I call my brothers in a sense, because they helped me to understand uh, my relationship in a way to the States and the West in a way in which they had similar relations because they were, we were all a similar age and um, we had similar ambition. Mm -hmm. And so with Okwi, you know, he was really a, a great leader in the sense of being able to, you know, head of the magazine and then with this vision, we wanted to be basically, and I, this is how I understood it. We mm -hmm. wanted to change the way the art world understood contemporary African artists. We wanted them to be able to say their names correctly without mispronunciation. We wanted them to be able to understand the art that these people made and see it on the same level in the same manner in which they looked at any other Western art without any degree of disrespect in the way that they looked at this work. We wanted it to be real and present and look better than the next thing. And so we took no prisoners in the way that we walked around and talked around about the art. And it was really like, in a way, war, you know, in the sense right. of being able to make sure that we got our point across in these institutions and at these places uh, all around, okay? I look at the younger kids, we talked about this earlier, but I look at the younger kids yeah. now and I think, wow, these guys are even more ruthless today <laughs> than we were back <laughs> then. But we were tough. We were tough, right. yeah. And so, um, and so you are. You also said a curating, and this was your 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 show at uh, at Rush Arts uh, about the same time in 1997. Yes, uh, there were uh, the artists in that show: Jocelyn Taylor, Fred Wilson, whose piece yeah. is here, um, Billy Bajoka, and um, uh, my Sengen and Gudi, yeah. and uh, uh, my myself. And uh, that's the piece I put up as a large photograph of the Vogue, of this Vogue cover where they had two covers, but the, the scandal was that the uh, Naomi, Ta Naomi, Naomi um, Campbell was, uh, was uh, the inner cover. You had, when you bought the magazine on the newsstand, uh, the woman here, I think her name is Nikki Taylor, but I'm not sure, she, she was on the cover and that's who, what you saw on the newsstand. You had to buy the magazine to open it up to see this other image being and hence talking about sales and whatnot and identity and and um, value and then this is another show uh you would uh, uh curate uh, much later at the jack shaman gallery in 2007 which which i also saw uh, actually in my first uh visit to the united states via at omai so I, I saw this show um um and this was a show that was focused on um the sort of the um Blackness understood through the lens of uh, the United States. Right. I mean, the thing is, this show was called The Color Line. And famously, The Color Line is speaking about the division between the races in the United States and America. Uh, and I use The Color Line in a positivist sense. I was thinking of it as the connection of, of color, the, the connection of color, the connection of the African diaspora around the world versus this idea of separating both black and white. I wanted to speak about African aidy and African diaspora in a global sense. Hence, you have Olu Guibe on the left, Mario Cravo Neto, who's Brazilian, right there with the photographs, and then Nick Cave uh, right there in the front. Um, I need to say, though, that the show uh, before this interior life, the importance of that show for me was this idea of speaking about essentially and simply the interiority of Black life and Black experience, because I was understanding the black body is seen only as a thing and only as a, something on the, to be seen on the surface with no sense of humanity inside that being, that body. And I wanted to investigate in different ways this idea of in, the interiorization of life and the humanity that exists in the black being versus just seeing them as object from the outside. Yeah. And so this is from, the, from, the, um, from Color Lines. And right. then you have another show uh, which you curated uh, at, at uh, the Rosette Museum at Brandeis College. Yes, yeah, so, uh, this was a drawing show essentially. Mm -hmm. And it was called a paper trail in my subtitle, Passing Through Clouds, uh, thinking of just the nature of the dust and drawing of that sort. This is the wall 
a wall painting I made as part of my contribution to the show. But we had artists as diverse as um, uh, uh, there's a, 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 a Richard Serra back there, the big black thing. There was an Anna Mendiata, and we had Rubens amongst other artists, but there were over 60 artists, 60 drawings in the exhibition. It was a really beautiful experience to go through the archives at Brandeis and also to be able to participate with this piece. That really is an exploration of drawing in as much as color on the wall. And so um, we, as we're running, we're basically running out of time. So right, running, right. Running. Things up. That's why so, I'm talking so fast. This is, I mean, it's fascinating, you know, I wish we could go on and on and on and on. But this is 1998, uh, at Art Oh My, um, you began to make your abstract paintings. Yes, it was important for me to come back to it. I mean, I see the photo based work came at a point where I was like, okay, what, maybe this abstraction, this work doesn't speak in the way that I want to about identity. Um, maybe I misunderstood it. I didn't it just didn't address it quickly enough. So I was doing the photo base work, but when I went to Oh My, I took all these cans of paint because I was using house paints, not to paint yet, using house paints and my canvases and it just started making paintings. And I remember it was a memorable visit with Betty Sue Hertz. She came through and basically talked about parsing my uh, information rather than throwing everything on the, on the canvas, basically parse it and be able to focus on one thing versus another. And the success of this experience at Art Omai was that after going around the world and seeing all these African artists and seeing all these artists making anything they wanted, I was like, why can't I make a painting as well? Why not? And so for me, that became the point of this experience at, uh, at uh, to oh my. That painting behind me was called, and it's the first big one because they were always small in a way in which like right. a computer or TV set kind of space. This one was about the body and this painting back there is called wall painting. Not knowing what I'd be doing in a bigger way later, but it was called wall painting in the sense of painting for the wall. And then this, this is your early work. I mean, this uh, painting uh, and, from, 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 the, from the very beginning uh, before yes. you, you moved the base work and then and then got back to this yes um, and, and then generations of tvs and computers and endless right. computers yeah and then this is uh your first wall wall painting am i right yes this is and the first, first wall show. painting uh, of this sort yeah yes 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 okay and this is that show in Canada. And then um, I'm going to skip this because it's going to get us into a much larger conversations. I'm going to skip this. And so I want us to sort of um, um, perhaps end the conversation here and then open it up for, uh, for, quest uh, for one or two questions. And so this is your Give Me Shelter um, at the Venice Biennial in 2007. And um, at this show, so I've said I was not, I wasn't going to talk about this show, but I'm just going to get back to it quickly. At this show, you met Robert Starr, and that was the way in, the way the journey to uh, to making this more expansive um, a wall 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 drawings uh, at Venice in 2007. So, yeah. can you talk about that context? Yes, and first of all, um, Robert and I met each other for the first time when I was a student at Bennington. He gave me a studio visit. We had some contention between each other, but it was very lightning and rich experience. We were friends over the years. He went to my show, that, that space you saw, and uh, saw a painting on the back wall, which is not imaged here. You can find it, it's called Anagata de Vida, the title of the piece. Mm -hmm. He saw that and understood it in relation to this space here. When I flew out in Venice to see it, it was like, a, it was used as a bar. Every wall was painted black, there were holes in the wall, it looked like a pit. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, what am I gonna be able to do here? But I, you know, Jack was like, Jack Shaman, he was like, well, make a schemata. And I was like, I'm not, I don't need to make any schemata, but I made a schemata and it really helped me. Because right. then I understood all the complication of this space, including above the lights, you see these arches, that's the work, part of the work as well. Those are pigments, pigmented, uh, iron oxide pigmented arches, which are like eyelashes or eyes as in as much as they are arches representing the city. This is an intersection space and I wanted it to be reflective of the canals in Venice where the building and buildings would catch the light that reflected off the water. So this is a lot about that light. In a sense, it's also about painting the way in which I ask the painting to give me shelter. The painting is giving shelter. And right. it's, a, it's a walkway. On that side, you have Sigmar Polke. On the other mm -hmm. side, we have Nancy Spiro. And I was embraced by two great artists there. And um, yeah, 
I had a conversation with uh, Sigmar Polke during my um, uh, during that opening and the preparations. Uh, Gerhard Richter walked through the space. We, I love music, so we had it blaring crazy. I had eight studio assistants work on this wall. We were all running around, and he walks through my space, and he's like, "WTF?" Like he's looking around like this. And then I catch his eye, he looks at me, I smile at him and he smiles at me. And then he just finishes walking through the space. Sigma Poke, uh, we talked and he said, um, it's really, he just said, it's really good that you're here. And I think he meant that on a, on a very personal level, dealing with the idea of not only of race and of, mm -hmm. of identity, but just in general, he just was really, really kind. He just said, it's really good you're here. And then Ellsworth, he said to me, you know, my work is before the war and your work is after the war. Nice. And however you take that, that was awesome. And El Ellsworth has been a great guy. Uh, you know, I miss him and he's, he was great. That was the first time we met. Yeah, and so we're, we're gonna end on that note. Um, okay. And so I'm gonna stop share and then um, and see if we have one or two questions, if there's time to take one or two questions. Right. Okay. I think they're in the chat, right? Yeah, well, there, yeah, there are, um, so there's a question by, um, uh, by Curtis Spence. I uh, said, is that, is your artwork permanent? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's the wall drawings, yeah, the wall painting. In some, in some places it is permanent and others it's not, of course. Uh, the thing is, when I started the project, it was always about knowing that in that case, in fact, when I was doing it, I knew that the work would all be wiped out. What was really uh, important about that was just that the work was made and that the work was experienced. It's like if you go to a concert or you're going to a poetry reading or you're going to just see something eventful. The important thing was being there and experiencing that and knowing that like, maybe like, I was looking at like life, you know, life comes and life goes, that you have the experience of the work and, and, and that would be it. What became fascinating to me is as these walls started to continue to be built, people would find their spot in the wall and take pictures of themselves. And that to me was very integral to the idea of what I was trying to do in the paintings where I was trying to put my body into those paintings when I first started making them. And I saw then that the visitor, the viewer was doing the same thing. Right. And that was very, very connected to this idea of being, becoming part of a space in the way in which maybe America or maybe Africa or maybe Nigeria wanting to be, exist in a space. Right the viewer was doing this too and taking their picture and, and making themselves be comfortable in that space that they chose for themselves. So this, this one question, uh, I think we will just take this one question, <laughs> the last question. So it's from uh, Cheryl Oppenheim. She said, um, I love what you said earlier. I think that was my intro about how color can represent and describe the complexity of life and emotion. So what would you be able to say a bit more about color and that ability to describe the, the world? Can you say that in two, in two, in two, in two sentences, I do it. Wow. Um, well, I think color is personal. I think it's a very personal thing. People shouldn't be afraid of it. I think that people are afraid of it for many different reasons. You know, chromo you could read the book Chromophobia. You can talk about the social, cultural reasons that uh, people are fearful of color. But I think that people are fearful of making mistakes and so forth. I think if you can personalize it and make it something that you understand through your, you know, as I've tried to do, I just try to have it, try to understand it through my history and experience of memory and maybe i use it as just sense of memory it's a way of capturing an experience or capturing a maybe a conversation or a place to me that's how i engage and that's how i make it my own um i have this exercise i do with students where i have them make colors and then they have to name them as part of a reason way of trying to get that cl color close to their own sense of being but i think it's just about that and that's maybe the best way i can say it in two two seconds or two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. You've been so wonderful and generous. Yeah. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm happy to do this. I'm Thank happy you. To do this. Thank you, Smooth. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Smooth and Odili for sharing your time um, with this audience. Um, Odili, thank you for trusting Bomb with sharing your life story. Um, it's been a pleasure to work on this project with the both of you. Um, to everyone who came tonight, we will be sharing the link to the live oral, his to the live oral history um, 
on the website. So you should be expecting that soon. Um, we thank you all so much for spending a portion of your evening with us. It's yes. wonderful. Um, hopefully we didn't uh, make you miss dinner. So <laughs> um, please go enjoy the rest of your evening. Get something to drink. Enjoy your time. Um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Come on!